Welcome everyone. Today we're going to be looking at the 1992 Disney musical fantasy comedy film uh, called Aladdin. Before we start analysing the film, it's just worth maybe taking a moment to think about how we look at films when we analyse them archetypally. Essentially all characters, um, and sometimes even things that aren't characters, like just phenomena in the film, but particularly all characters are aspects of the self. So the first of the main characters we meet uh, is Jafar who is the advisor to the Sultan, the chief advisor to the Sultan. And this is an absolutely classic archetypal position to be in. Um, he's also the main villain of the film, as, as obviously we know. Um, but what's interesting about here, what, what we could say he really represents is almost not pu almost pure intellect. Um, he's he's calcu cold, calculating, logical, um, so again, if we, if we think about this in terms of what it is within us, um, it is perhaps that logical, rational part of ourself. Um, and because, you know, we could think of the logical, rational part of ourself as less emotional, maybe less caring, um, it's easy for us to fall into, uh, if, if we, if we only use that kind of thinking, um, we think in terms of well, what can we get out of a situation, out of a person even, um, how can we exploit the world or others um, for our own selfish gain? Um, and that's the problem with perhaps, you know, uh, rationalism without the kind of uh, heartfelt feeling of feelings of kind of care and compassion and kindness and selflessness. Um, and I'll just just make a note of, of um, Diago. Yeah, so the parrot is, a, is an interesting choice of companion for the you know, if we think of Jafar as the sort of villainous intellect, um, because if you think about the intellect as very self-aggrandizing, grandiose, arrogant, um, falling in love with the fruits of its own creation, um, it's been put as, uh, it would make absolute sense, wouldn't it, that a parrot, something that just repeats back what you're already saying, would be the, uh, the, the pet of choice. <laughs> so we meet Aladdin, who, as we know, is um, he's he's a, a street rat, as they call him. So next we meet the Sultan, who is a very sweet, charming buffoon of a man. <laughs> and I, I highlight this um, because it is from a from an archetypal standpoint. It is, again, very kind of, um, well, yeah, it's an archetype that the old king has lost touch with his kingdom. Um, he's he's uh, sort of doddery or essentially blind to what's really going on, um, because obviously Jafar, the villain, is his chief advisor, um, which, and he's not aware of, you know, Jafar's real motives. Um, so he's, he's, yeah, he's, he's blind to what's happening. So it's a common uh, archetypal theme that you have a king or a leader of some kind who is blind to what's really going on. Um, and uh, so this kind of can, this can represent the individual being out of touch with reality or failing to see the malevolence that's really around them. So another example would be Scar uh, in, is it Scar? The, 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 the first king in the Lion King, um, who doesn't realise his brother is, you know, plot, he's a good king, but he doesn't realise his brother is plotting to overthrow him. Um, from, a, from a mythological point of view, when the king loses touch, when he becomes blind to what's really happening, that's when it's time for a new king. Um, and not only that, in the film, it's also time for Jasmine to marry because... Um, She's come of age. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of one of the driving plot points is that she needs to find a new a, a suitor to be to be wed to. Um, but the uh, the suitor, the prince that we just saw that kicked Aladdin into the dirt, we see him walking out with a chunk a chunk of his trousers having been ripped away. Uh, the chunk of his trousers missing, and his pants showing, his arse showing, and 
we then see that it was Raja, Princess Jasmine's pet tiger, that did that. And hers is, her animal is Raja, it's tiger, so there's a fierceness to her. We've seen Raja maybe as the fierce side of the feminine. And Jasmine herself is a very fiery character, um, very quick to, um, very quick to criticise injustice, to stand up for herself. You know, she's refusing to um, just simply find a suitor just because it's legally time for her to get married. She says, if I do marry, I want it to be for love. So we could see the feminine doesn't want to just go along with um, what's codified, sort of scripture or law or, or kind of... Um, yeah, she, she wants to be free to explore. I mean, literally as well. She says she's, you know, grown up her whole life in, essentially captive in the palace. She's been protected by the patriarchy, by her father, the king, growing up safe in the palace with guards. But she wants to go out into the world. She wants to be free to explore, to explore the world, to, to meet people. We get a lovely little shot of uh, Princess Jasmine in this first scene where we see her taking a bird out of a cage and just letting it go. I mean, you know, what could be more <laughs> symbolic than that than just wanting to be free. <laughs> but this is just archetypal of growing up, isn't it? That, you know, we could say good parents protect their children when they're young and then as they grow older and older, they protect them less and less um, and allow them to really, you know, meet life, even though meeting life means getting clobbered sometimes. Obviously, the Sultan isn't doing this with Jasmine, so she's taking matters into her own hands, as young people often will. will. Um, so she's deciding to just go off out into the world, because and I suppose there's maybe a lesson there, isn't there, that if we protect, try to protect, overprotect, if we protect our children too much, then eventually they will just run away uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean literally run away but in some way if 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 we make these walls too high um, it will be counterproductive because well they're going to climb them or they're going to bury under them and in, in the film it's literally what jasmine is doing she's climbing a tree to hop over the wall <laughs> now we see aladdin in shackles and this is an, a key point he's very embarrassed now because he realizes oh my god that wasn't just some street rat like me that was the princess I, and he says i must have looked so stupid to her so what we're seeing is the young masculine the young male feeling embarrassed shame around his position in society he's a street rat um, he how how could he have been so presumptuous and stupid to just be chatting with a princess like it was nothing, which is going to be important as the story develops. They go to the cave, um, and the cave says, touch nothing but the lamp. So I suppose maybe there's something about that. Like, If you can be focused on your goal and walk past material wealth without being distracted by the shiny things of this world, you can reach a deeper treasure, um, a much more special treasure which is the genie. This is when the genie appears, obviously voiced by Robin Williams, who we, we love. You know, what on earth is it that the genie in the lamp symbolizes? The Sultan wants to make Aladdin the new Sultan. Of course, if he marries the princess, that's what he's got to become. But this is the key bit. This is where Aladdin starts to doubt himself because, okay, he's been made into a prince by the genie. He's rich now. He's got gold and servants and the clothes. He's got everything. He's got everything outwardly that he would need to be a prince and then to eventually become sultan, to embody the king Enji, to be the protector of the realm. <laughs> but it's false you know he says i can't i can't become sultan like i'm just this street rat aladdin um so there's now this so you know you could think about this in the real world when you think about someone that really wants to have status and money so someone that maybe works really hard in business 
um, or trades stocks or you know something climbs their claws their way up to making good money and to maybe owning a business managing people or something but it's not come from an authentic place within them so even though they've got the money and the status and the clothes and the cards they don't actually have kingly energy whatsoever it's all superficial there's nothing behind it backing it up this, this is where aladdin has a big meltdown and a big tantrum and he's like sorry genie i can't free you anymore because i've got to use my last because i need to keep you around essentially i can't set you free because i need to keep you doing my bidding because otherwise because i'm nothing without you you know the ego isn't developed yet and it's and so it feels like it needs to rely on whatever it is the genie is this inner soul power this genius that he's discovered the the ego is still in charge here the ego needs to use the more the, the the soul power the genius to keep up the facade of greatness and he gets all upset and he starts falling out with everyone including even Naboo you know he's he's saying oh he's, he's said, since you say screw you all like none of you get it pressure pressure uh, he's, he's he's basically being a boy uh, <laughs> he's not become a man yet he's not ready to take on the king energy and, and become Sultan. We've got a big struggle coming up before he's ready for that. The Sultan is just about to um, announce to the city that Jasmine's found a suitor. At this exact point, Aladdin is trying to tell Jasmine, look, there's something I really need to tell you. I'm a complete imposter. And then also at this exact moment, it really all comes to a head here, Jafar, steals the lamp. Jafar's first wish, as we could have predicted, is that he wants to be Sultan. So boom, he's instantly made Sultan. There's a, there's a shot and a scene I really like where Jafar gets the genie to pick the palace up from the city and, and place it on top of a mountain next to the city. And I like this idea that good king energy the palace is in the city, it's part of the city. It's not, although it's clearly the grandest building and the biggest building, it's still part of the city. It's on the same ground, sort of equal in a way. Whereas Jafar, that's not good enough. He wants the genie to pick the very palace up and place it onto the mountain so it towers above the city. And I suppose that could be some, you know, say something about good leadership versus tyrannical leadership. And there's a really lovely shot here of uh, the, the previous shot, Jasmine's dad. He goes to bow, he instantly goes to bow. <laughs> Whereas Jasmine says, we will never bow to you. So he says, if you will not bow before a sultan, you will cower before a sorcerer. First thing he does after becoming a most powerful sorcerer in the world is he says, where were we? Ah, yes, abject humiliation. He zaps the sultan and princess Jasmine who are magically forced to bow to him, um, which is good enough for him. He's not looking for he's not looking for respect. He's he's looking, he's just looking for to control. You know, he's, he's uh, the fact that they hate him, despise him, yet they're being forced to bow to him by his magic. That's good enough for him. When Jafar reveals to Jasmine that Aladdin is actually not a prince but the street rat she first met that is his real identity and there's a nice shot where Jafar zaps Aladdin who loses all these beautiful uh you know uh princely clothing and is returned to the sort of yeah street rat outfit we saw him in at the start and he sort of looks down with a face full of shame um and sort of says, oh, I, I tried to tell you. It's pretty simple here, isn't it? It's like, if you try and pretend to be something you're not, you're going to get found out and you're going to feel really ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Jafar, like, puts Aladdin, Nabu, Abu and the magic carpet in, like, one of, like a turret from one of the towers and just sort of launches it away. Um, and they end up actually in the middle of a snowstorm. 
And there's this really nice little scene where Aladdin is freezing cold, he's shivering, and he's just digging around in the snow for Naboo. Um, and he says, this is all my fault. I should have freed the genie when I had the chance. And so this is an important point. If you think about the kind of development of an individual, um, and then, you know, if, if all the characters, as we said at the start, are aspects of the self, Aladdin is the ego, the part of us on the hero's journey. And it's the moment of admitting, I've ballsed up, I've been lying, um, and I've put other people at risk due to my greed, my own selfish desires. The big fight scene, um, and Jafar's just zapping everyone with his magic and Aladdin says why don't you fight me a selfie cowardly snake and Jafar says snake am I well why don't we see just how snake like I can be and turns himself into this giant snake so it's really common in mythology um, for there to be some kind of fight with a dragon or a snake um, but if you think that um, back when we were sort of you know pre civilization um the things that lurked in the dark and you know in the bushes the dangerous things would be things like snakes um so that this the snake or the dragon can kind of represent almost like an amalgam of dangerous predators one one thing that the fight with the snake or the dragon can represent is a symbolic fight with chaos um wrestling with chaos or kind of uh, order overcoming chaos. So Jafar is winning the fight until the point where Aladdin gets right when it's seemingly all over and they're pretty much defeated. Aladdin gets a little brainwave and he says, Jafar, you'll only ever be second best. The genie will always have more power than you. And obviously Jafar can't have that. The fact that he's now the most powerful person in the world is not enough because there's still the genie. So he wishes to become an all-powerful genie and uh, obviously the mistake he makes there is that with becoming an all-powerful genie you become bound to serve. It's interesting that Aladdin uses the trickster part of himself to overcome the villain. As Aladdin uses uh, the trickster energy you could see this as a kind of integration of the shadow. Um, so obviously like in Jungian psychology, we all have a shadow and it's full of dark and shameful things, uh, things that we're ashamed of, things that we, we don't like about ourselves. And, you know, we often, uh, so in, in Jungian psychology, the idea is that we um, unconsciously repress them so we don't, we don't look at them, uh, we kind of bury them in our unconscious. Um, but to become whole, one has to integrate their shadow. So far more important than the fight scene is what comes next, which is Aladdin apologizing to Jasmine and saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have lied to you. I was a trickster with Jafar and that was using my trickster energy in a positive way. But I lied to you uh, and I shouldn't use my trickster energy with you. The thing, it's not just that he's apologizing, he's saying, well, I'm guess, I guess and they're all sad and he's saying, I guess this is it. As in now that I reveal that I'm not really a prince, well, I can't marry you because the law says you must be married to a prince. So he's willing to give up everything he wanted because he'd rather just tell the truth now. Like all he's wanted the whole time is Jasmine, right? He wants, uh, he wants to get the girl, but he's like, right, I can't get the girl through lying. So if it's between lying to get the girl and being authentic and losing her, well, I've seen what lying does. I'm gonna choose to be honest, true. The genie says, look, you've got one wish left. Why don't you wish to be a prince again? And then you can marry her. And he's like, nope, I wish for your freedom. Cause he's matured now. <laughs> How would one work with archetypes with a client? There are a number of ways you could do so. Um, I think the first sort of step generally would be to ex would be to explain to the client the concept of archetypes, um, so they understood 
uh, you know, what was meant by them. Uh, one way I know of um, is, is uh, a way that I worked in, with archetypes in my own personal therapy. Um, so my therapist had um, cards, lots of different cards with lots of different archetypes on them. And she laid them out across the table and asked me to pick out three, um, pick out three, the three that I was most drawn to. And then we kind of explored, you know, why I was drawn to those three um, and what they meant for me and what they brought up for me, etc. Um, and then I think also, you know, if if a if a if a counselor and a client both knew of uh, a, uh, the same story, you know, they both read a particular book or watched a film, um, then I think you could actually reference characters in that story. Um, in a, it, as a way to sort of bring the archetype to life rather than it just being an abstract concept like the warrior, the king, etc. You can actually talk about a particular character, uh, you know, in a particular story as they're manifesting a particular archetype, how that affects other people, what that means for them, what that, you know, the journey that takes them on, etc, etc. Well, thank you for watching. Um, I hope it's been interesting and uh, if you know if there's any other kind of mythological archetypal psychological spiritual themes that i might have missed or symbolism then please put them in the comments and let's have a little discussion about that um yeah i wish you all the best and thank you for watching